All right. Well, this is, uh, yeah, thank you. This is the part of the day where you're starting to get a little fried. You know, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of content to take in, a lot of conversations. You know, you're, the headache starts, the blood sugar is collapsed. So lunch is great. You get a little more carbs in you, get you fired up, and then, and then uh, give you the really good stuff after lunch to keep you awake. We... Um, pride ourselves on being very stakeholder driven and very uh, reliant on the community that we are lucky enough to help uh, convene and, and support. Uh, we rely on those stakeholders to engage with us when we develop our content. And that takes a number of forms. It takes the form of the, the convening panel. It also takes the form of people saying, hey, you know, I really want to be on this panel. Can I, this voice is missing. And it also takes the form of having to be flexible when someone says, I want to be there, I committed to be there, I just can't. And so there's a lot of, when you have 60 speakers, there's a lot of like, you know, give and take, uh, like the, the, the Thanksgiving uh, dinner table. It's a lot of like energy and it's, it's a big, big table and big crowd. And, and I think that's part of what makes state of reform special and truly unique. And I think that's part of what is going to make our lunch panel special and truly unique. And for another reason, which I'll, I'll tell you about here in a second. But I want to invite all five of our uh, panel members to come on up. Not the five that are listed. There are four here. We have one more. So come on up. Uh, Dr. Bob Dannenhofer, Dr. Monica Webby, Sean Colmer, uh, Douglas County Commissioner uh, Tim Freeman, and uh, BJ Kavner from uh, 104 Health. You know, I... I uh, I am a lot of things. One of them is not smart. And um, so here 10 minutes ago, I, being the math major that I am, realized we don't have enough chairs. Uh, so how many people remember Phil Donahue? There are a few people in here, right? Over people. So we're going to do this lunch keynote special, or this keynote panel, Phil Donahue style. I'm going to take my roving <laughs> mic. I'm going to go into the audience. And we're going to have a little more audience engagement than might otherwise take place. And the reason why is because all of our members uh, that you see here committed to be here today, and we appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Dannenhofer, Dr. Webby, Sean, uh, uh, BJ, and then Jeb Bush came to town. And Jeb Bush, Governor uh, Bush of Florida, is here today, not here, state of reform, in Portland. Don't. He is in Portland. He is not at the Hilton that I know of. Um, and so Dr. Webby has to, uh, ha was invited for a special meeting with Governor Bush and then had to, couldn't be in two places at once because the meeting hap is happening now. And uh, so she declined her, uh, last week. And so I, I reached out because I had been corresponding with uh, Douglas County Commissioner Freeman. I reached out to him and said, hey, you are a well-respected Republican leader. You, you bring a local perspective from Douglas County, uh, and you're actively engaged in the CCO there. Why don't you come join us, and you can take uh, Monica's spot? He said, I would be happy to drive three hours and be with you. Uh, uh -huh. So we put him to work. And then when uh, Representative Cedric Hayden said he couldn't make it, I said, hey, Commissioner Freeman, you want to join our Republican panel? So <laughs> he said, yeah, you bet. So he's doing double duty, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and then... Uh, I'm just going to call you all by your first name, so I hope you'll <laughs> allow me. And then Monica said, look, DJ, I really do not want to leave you in a lurch. I know you've only got a few days. You've already gone to print. What if I tell Jeb Bush that I'm only going to give him, like, 20 minutes? And I come hang out with you for 30. And then I'm going to make a 12-minute trip in 10 minutes, and it'll all work out fine. And I said, love it. Thank you. So, uh, so Monica, thank you for uh, telling the governor, former governor of Florida that he can just wait. Uh, and, and, and you can hang out with us. So we have, so uh, Monica will leave us here in about, uh, about 30 minutes or so. And this actually gives us an opportunity for me to put a microphone in your face when you're least expecting it. 
it'll help you stay uh, attentive as, I'm, as we're having our lunch panel. But I want to start uh, with you all, panel members, with a thank you for your participation and ask you a, a similar question that started us this morning and ask you just sort of because we have a big panel to, uh, to give me the elevator pitch. But Monica, we'll start with you. What are you watching in Oregon healthcare today and nationally in healthcare? What are the things as a provider, as a political figure that you're keeping your eye on as you watch trends in data in Oregon healthcare? Well, I think my major concern as a doctor has always been the doctor-patient relationship. And I see a problem that came in with the healthcare law was trying to make everything the same, a oh, top-down, one-size-fits-all approach, which is really not the way to do it. Uh, different people need different plans. You know, different plans work for different families. I'm also very concerned about some of the mandates, what they're going to do to business. You know, businesses may opt to pay the penalty because it's cheaper than buying insurance for their employees. Or a lot of people, young, healthy people, may opt out to pay the penalty rather than buy insurance and go into the pool. And then as a result, the whole price of the pool goes up because only sick people are in the pool. I'm very concerned about, about uh, making sure that doctor-patient relationship remains paramount, that people have choice, and that it's affordable and that there's access for, for everyone, but we have to be able to do it in a way that's affordable. Yeah. Maybe a stepwise approach may have been better than a massive overhaul at once, but yeah. we got a lot of correcting we're gonna have to do. So Bob, as a leader in the CCO community, uh, former CEO and uh, long, -time, long time leading voice in Oregon healthcare, how is that approach that how is the CCO model working? Does Monica's suggestion of maybe a little more incremental approach apply well in the Medicaid space in Oregon? Or do we need to move faster than we're already moving? What, what would your comment be in terms of speed in the Oregon Medicaid space? Well, I think in retrospect, the CCO implementation went remarkably well. And I think what was remarkable is that there wasn't the catastrophe that everybody predicted. If you'd been there in 11 and 12, the sky was falling many times, and it didn't fall. We brought in all these new people, and we were able to provide them coverage. We have coverage from CCOs in every area in the state. I mean, really, truly remarkable interventions that did. So actually, in retrospect, I think the timing was almost perfect on the CCO side. However, I think on the insured side, the ACA side, it's uh, still a little bit up in the air about whether this is going to work. I think some of Monica's, Monica's concerns are really there. The, the penalty is so small for not, being, uh, not buying insurance that I think there are still a lot of people out who need to be in the system. Yeah. So, Sean, I'll ask you a little bit tricky spot because now that you're at HMA and, uh, and no longer with the governor, I could ask you, I guess, a host of questions, that none of which you'd answer on the stage. But uh, on this question of cost and now transcending Medicaid, the Cadillac tax is on the horizon. Mm -hmm. 2018, 40% excise tax for all benefit packages. Got any solutions for that? I mean, how does the uh, how does how do we, how do we take the learnings from the CCO marketplace and apply it more broadly to this cost conundrum in in group and uh, self-insured markets? So I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, transformation for those of us who have all been around a while was wasn't just about Medicaid. It was always about changing the way sort of the delivery system works and getting better outcomes for the people who access it. So I think the thing that I'm looking forward to the most. Uh, is not only the evolution of the CCOs as a Medicaid program, but also how our public employees purchase health care and the continued steps they have, and especially the Oregon educators. If you think about the state as a purchaser, the state purchases for almost a million and a half people in the state. Uh, and so the state has a lot of leverage and can use that leverage to begin to drive innovation and drive change. And if you look specifically at the Cadillac tax, um, PEB has actually done a pretty great job preparing themselves for that. Yeah. and not using the traditional methods of changing benefits to get underneath it, but really talking about how you hold total cost of care down in order to stay underneath things like that. And that's really about changing the delivery model and putting incentives in the right place in order to get that kind of change. So you were a health care uh, policy staff person under Governor Kitzhaber, uh, held the same position under <coughs> Governor Brown. I think Governor Brown and, and Governor Kitzhaber are well known to many, but Governor Kitzhaber may be a little more well known to this community. How would you characterize Governor Brown's 
leadership on health care and health policy. So, so the governor <coughs> understands what this group is trying to do and what health care in Oregon is trying to achieve. Uh, and she supports that, and she supported that when I was with her. Uh, and I think uh, her hiring of Jeremy Van de Hey as the next policy buyer shows you her commitment uh, to this process and making sure that it works. Because yeah. regardless of what your issue is, regardless of whether you're an education person, whether you're a you know, business person, w whatever you are, if we don't begin to continue to solve this healthcare issue and continue to evolve and succeed, all the other stuff's gonna matter less and less. Yeah. Um, so this has to work in order for us to think about how to fund education, how to fund public safety, how to help counties with local corrections issues. Um, those kinds of things are gonna have to be uh, at least somewhat on the back of uh, figuring out how to solve the cost issue with healthcare. So Tim, uh, Commissioner Freeman, former Representative Freeman, you know, as you know, as one of the Republican leaders on CCO, uh, on the CCO legislation, part of the vision was to help counties, as, as Sean's intimating, uh, help them divert folks into the criminal justice system and help integrate mental health with, with physical health. <clears throat> now that you are out of Salem and actively involved in, the, in a CCO and implementing it, is it working on the ground in Douglas County like it was envisioned a few years ago in the halls of Salem? So that's a great question. So uh, I have quite a bit of ownership in the work that we did around uh, the creation of CCOs, uh, having served as the uh, co-chair of the Joint Special Committee on Healthcare Transformation. I had never envisioned the fact that I would be at a county level doing the work uh, that was directed by the policy that we passed in the legislature. Uh, if I'd have known that, I may have spent a little more time to get it right. Uh, although I, <laughs> I will tell you, things are working well for us in Douglas County, and, and we did good work there. Uh, the, the best thing that we did uh, for counties and for communities in that legislation was to allow flexibility, to allow each county and each community to figure out how it works best for them. So in Douglas County, the, the, before I became a commissioner, the county commission gave back the mental health authority to the state. I believe we were the first to do that. And that sounded pretty dramatic when I heard that as a state representative. And now that I'm at the county, I see the wisdom in doing that. Getting uh, rural county government out of the way of health care, uh, especially around the, the mental health services, was really a good move. It's allowing a, a new nonprofit to do that work in a much uh, cleaner way without all the, the political challenges of having an elected board doing, doing the policy on that work. I serve on the nonprofit board that's doing that work. So I, I get to really see the, the great work of mental health being, uh, being done in a different way and, and really expanding and being integrated. Mm -hmm. uh, and you talked a little bit about the criminal justice system. We have a, a local coordinating council uh, that's doing that very work and looking at how mental health services um, can help keep people out of the, the criminal justice system, and, and that's moving forward very well. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dannenhoff has really been a leader in our community doing this work, uh, but now that I'm at the local level, I get to do some of that, and I'm excited and, and, and really um, really thinking moving forward, we're going to be able to do a lot of great stuff. Yeah, so things great. are going well. So if you all have questions, I've successfully walked around once and not tripped, so I feel more confident that I can come to you with a mic and ask you a question without falling on my face. So if you have a question, just go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll, I'll come over, and we'll just deepen this dialogue and, and engage you all a little more actively. Uh, BJ, as, as uh, the executive director of uh, One in Four Chronic Care, or Chronic Health, uh, you know, you're very much a patient advocate, and mm -hmm. uh, in, in many ways, in many instances, people with chronic health conditions rely on on uh, prescription drug uh, uh, support and treatment. Right. Pharma's made a lot of news about being very expensive lately. Gilead's drug uh, started the conversation, but now we're talking about cholesterol drugs costing twelve to fourteen thousand dollars a year. <clears throat> how does how does that cost issue? get addressed if we don't ask patients to cover even more of the cost and become more active in their healthcare choices? It's, it's difficult and, and it requires everybody being at the table to have these discussions. It requires discussions beyond what the cost of a medication is. It, it requires that we have discussions about what the value of medications are in general. Um, Obviously, the most effective things that we can do 
to prevent chronic health conditions is having health literacy, educating people, providing the services that they need to not become sick. So that, that's the first step. The second is to treat people as soon as we possibly can before conditions get worse. You know, we talk about the, the cost of the hep C medications. We also aren't talking equally about the cost of not doing anything. The cost of not treating a patient with hepatitis C is $1.2 million over the course of that patient's lifetime. They will live on average 14 years shorter and the cost goes up from there. It's roughly $40,000 a year by current standards. That's not saying that everybody who has hepatitis C needs treatment right now, and in fact, some may never need treatment. But the idea of being able to work to make certain and provide that people have access to those treatments in a way that will improve and maintain their health Regarding the cost of medications, it is a conundrum. Um, it's, it's a very big issue, and it's a very big issue for a lot of patients. We routinely see patients who will reach their out-of-pocket max in January or February. And just think about that. That's $6,500 in copays that you have to come up with in January. But you know, one thing, one, one thing I am lucky and honored to do, Bob, is see a lot of different states and how different states do different things. And one thing that Oregon is just, in my estimation, off the charts on is cancer research. And uh, so today it's, it's uh, hep C, tomorrow, or, you know, tomorrow is cholesterol, the day after tomorrow is genome-specific cancer treatments that really are priced only for you. Buy, you know, buy one today, get, get a second one free tomorrow. How do risk-bearing entities like you know the CCOs or any risk-bearing entity, stay sustainable in an increasing a climate of increasing pharmaceutical costs and those that are specific to genomes. What, what's the prognosis there, as you from where you sit as an executive? Well, the the prognosis is mixed. Uh, let me tell you a story. So there's a little boy that I took care of a few years ago, about 20 years ago now, who had a disease called Gaucher's disease, a disease where the body lacks an enzyme to get rid of a, a, a metabolite in the body. And he had watched his uncles die this terrible, painful death where their livers and spleens enlarged. Uh, they had terrible bone pain, and they died at, at a young age. When the family found out that he had this disease, they saw that he was, he was faced with the same kind of terrible death that his uncles had had before him. The next year, they came up with a drug called Cerdase. Cerdase was the specific enzyme that he lacked that would allow him to live well. And when it was first came out, it was incredibly expensive. It was made from millions of placentas. So he had to gather in millions of placentas and put it together and get this enzyme and give it to him. And he gave it to him, and, and his large spleen went away. His platelet count came to normal, and his bone pain went away. Truly a remarkable thing. It was remarkable at the time it was $1,000 a month. Well, at $1,000 a month, you could justify that because it was a lot of placentas to collect and a lot of work to do to get it. Well, over the years, he has continued to be well, but the cost of that medicine went from about $15,000 a year to now well over $300,000 a year, and it's no longer made by collecting millions of placentas. It's made by yeast who, who put this, stuff, put, put this uh, uh, stuff out, and it's much, 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 much less expensive to produce, yet the cost of it is 40 times what it was before. There's no way in the world we could tell him or his family or the thousands of other people who have disease like this that we can't afford to do it. On the other hand, we have to come up with a way to do it. There's a new drug out for, for cystic fibrosis that is presumably going to make a big difference, but it's $240,000 a year. And, and cystic fibrosis is our most common genetic defect. We do not know how we're going to do this. On the one hand, we don't want to stifle innovation. Because without innovation, we wouldn't have come up with this drug that will save this young man's life. We wouldn't come up with the drugs that will save these kids with cystic fibrosis. On the other hand, these drugs make, these drug costs make very little sense. The biggest cost for the executive are not these one-off drugs. It's actually like the cost of insulin, which I can remember in my time was less than $20 a bottle. It's now up to $500 a bottle. 
This is insulin, and there's no generic insulin out there. Look at the cost of the drugs for multiple sclerosis when they came out. Now, with their more competition, the cost of the drugs has tremendously increased. We have got to do something about it. This is not an Oregon problem. This is a national problem, right. and we need to have some reasonable national discussion. So, audience members, you can mark today, September 15th, as the, <clears throat> the day you had a conversation uh, that included the word placenta seven times over lunch. <laughs> <laughs> that does Millions. not happen very often. Millions of placentas. Very often. Um, <clears throat> DJ, yes. to, to the point is, yes, the, the drug prices are high, and I'm going to let the drug manufacturers talk to that. From the patient perspective, we're also seeing our share of cost has gone up remarkably. With the introduction of specialty tiers, you're seeing patients pay as much as 50% of the cost of the medication, that two or three years ago they maybe had a fifty or seventy-five dollar copay. Now the actual price of the medication itself has not gone up that much. Mm -hmm. What's shifted is the percentage that patients are paying, um, and the profit in this case is going to the yeah. insurance provider. So, Monica, I want to follow up on that. Uh, how do you? And we had this conversation a little bit last night at dinner. How do you, and I'll preface by saying you are clearly on record as being pro-economic uh, growth and pro-business, and, 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 uh, but how do you <clears throat> drive down the costs in healthcare like those of pharma or other costs, and at the same time empower people to be more active in their healthcare without asking them to pay more of their healthcare costs? I mean, don't those things go hand in hand that as soon as people feel the pain of healthcare, they will become often more active in managing those costs in healthcare. If they are disintermediated from their healthcare costs, if they don't have to pay it, they don't care what it costs. Doesn't the solution lie in actually making us as consumers feel more pain in terms of higher costs to make it better in the long run? Well, one thing I have to mention when we were talking about the cost of pharmaceuticals that never seems to get brought up is liability. And I think a lot of the reason that we see such astronomical cost in our drugs, remember when the vaccine cost went up so high because everyone was suing the pharmaceutical companies because of vaccinations? We've got to do something about that. That also affects our cost as, as super specialist, you know, neurosurgeons, we're uh, on the top of the food chain for liability costs. I mean, some of us pay $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 in premiums a year uh, for medical liability coverage. And so that's a big issue if we could rein in some of the frivolous lawsuits, which has always been an issue. Um, but as far as, as uh, health care and cutting cost, we really need to talk about the issue of people taking more responsibility for their health care. But and doesn't people, that mean paying more for their health care? I, mean, I think, mean you know, we've got to start putting a little bit of responsibility on the patient where, uh, just like we do with uh, driver's license, you know, if you um, get a speeding ticket, your, your, your cost of insurance goes up, or if you're in an accident, your cost goes up. Well, you know, if you uh, are a smoker, your, your cost should go up. If you are things that are going to cost the group more, you should be responsible for it to a degree. You know, you should try to have some control, maintain, you know, take your blood pressure medicine, make sure you're under control, all of these things, because the cost is shared amongst all of us. Yeah. And so we have to start having some personal re responsibility. When it is a shared cost, we should have some shared responsibility. I know we're going to lose you here in just a, a minute, so let me ask this sort of separate question uh, that I think any legislator could answer. Um, isn't this hard campaigning on health policy? I mean, the, the politics are terrible. No, there's no silver bullet on policy. Uh, what is this like trying to provide thought leadership on health policy, regardless of whether one agrees or disagrees with a given position? What is that like, trying to talk about it coherently? I think no matter what you say can get spun against you regardless. <laughs> um, I've never seen uh, anything like, uh, like running for office. Um, medicine does not prepare you for it because 
Medicine is a profession of truth, honesty, reality, <laughs> ethics. Um, and when you get into uh, politics, there really is none of that. Uh, it's it's yeah. stunning. Um, but, I, but I will say, no matter what you say, it can be spun the wrong way. We, we all want, and, and this strikes me at, at our dinner last night and every time I talk to people from all over the political spectrum, we all want the same thing. We all want everybody to have access to care. We all want everybody to have the best care they can. We want everybody to have choice. We want everybody to have access to their doctor. We don't want them to be, uh, uh, we want them to keep the plan they want, keep the doctor they want. We want costs to go down, all of the three big promises that were made with Obamacare. We want that. Everybody wants it, but we just have different ways of getting there. And no side has a monopoly on good ideas. There are good ideas from both sides. And until we can sit down and stop throwing rocks at each other and actually listen, we're not going to get there. Yeah. Because when, when, whenever you have a board, whenever you're putting together a board at a business, you put together people that come from different backgrounds, different ideas, diversity of thought, diversity of opinion. Otherwise, you don't want to sit in a big echo chamber of everybody that sees everything the same way, because then you get blindsided by, uh, by other ideas that come up that you never thought of because you were all thinking one way. Yeah. And I think that's the key, is that we have to listen to each other a little bit more. Well, I know that you've got to go. Yes. And I, I thank you for telling uh, Governor Bush that he can be second place and for <laughs> being here with us. Let's just give Monica a quick round of applause. <laughs> Gentlemen, she jumped down in high heels. I just yeah. note that. Backwards. Oh. <laughs> I'll, come, I'll come and take her spot since no one was eager to raise their hand. I even specifically asked a few of you and you demurred. Um, uh, Tim, Commissioner, uh, uh, you know, we talked a little bit this morning about healthcare being local, or that ideally, and Oregon has committed over the years to making healthcare a community conversation, but it seems like the trends in healthcare are towards consolidation in many, in many ways. Uh, and in some cases, that's consolidation of, say, mental health services at the county into something like a CCO model. In some cases, it's uh, for-profit health plans that are publicly traded on Wall Street coming in and, and investing in Oregon. Uh, I say investing, other people might use a different verb. Uh, nevertheless, how, how does a county that is clearly invested in the CCO model and clearly invested in transformation in Oregon healthcare measure that interest from the outside with all of those resources and, and experience that, that could be brought to bear in your community against the interests of local control and keeping it in Douglas County? So, so that's a great question. And one of the things we struggled uh, the most with when we were doing the policy around coordinated care organization is how to find that balance. How do you keep the incentive for the people locally to be involved? How do you have some local control uh, but allow that local control to be uh, done differently around the state. Uh, one of the things that's in the legislation, uh, as part of a CCO, a county has to be a member. So we, we put that in there specifically so counties representing the citizens of the county would always have a seat at the table. And, and I think what you'll find is that the counties that embrace that and understand uh, their role representing the citizens of their community on these policy decisions, those counties will be very effective in making sure that the health care is being delivered well. Uh, counties that don't realize really the importance of that seat at the table uh, may not have quite, uh, quite the involvement or quite as good an outcome. It, it, we see it almost like it's, a, um, it's just another spot on the, on, the, uh, on the CCO board, but it's literally the only spot uh, that is fixed because of the county uh, isn't going to change. You can't bring a county in from another area and be that county. Mm -hmm. You can bring a mental health provider in, you can bring a dental organization. All the other slots you could fill, but the county slot is really the, the, the veto or the, uh, the spots that's there to make sure the citizens are being represented. And uh, the importance of that, I think, in some counties is missed. In some counties, it's realized very clearly. In Douglas County, we recognize the importance 
of, of health care services to the citizens of the entire county, and we're at the table helping make those decisions. Yeah. So, Sean, you, now that you're at HMA, and of course can speak freely, uh, <laughs> and you've been able to start seeing uh, through your work there how other states are, are uh, addressing waiver questions or innovating uh, through CMMI grants and the like, uh, where has Oregon really fallen down? You know, both in your perspective from the governor's office and now at HMA, where has Oregon not done well enough on behalf of its citizens to transform healthcare? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the, the first thing that I've learned is uh, Oregon is still the top three places that anybody asks about. Uh, in terms of the work that a lot of people in this room have done. So they want to know about the structures, they want to know about the governance, they want to know about the quality metrics, they want to know how people are getting the outcomes. Um, so Oregon's reform efforts on the delivery side have been, continue to be lauded uh, nationally in terms of how they do things. If you look at what New York is doing with their Medicaid program, if you look at what Washington has begun to do with their SIM work, Alaska through their Medicaid expansion work, all of those states, uh, are stealing very liberally from the work that we all did here. So I think that's a, a congratulations to everybody in this room. Uh, and I think, tailing from my previous job into this one, I think the, the conundrum continues to be uh, sort of the integration of behavioral and addictions work within not only the CCO structure as a structure in Medicaid, but also just as a community. Um, the state is a huge investor in uh, behavioral health. Uh, both through the Medicaid program and outside of the Medicaid program. How does that relationship change, uh, or should it change, uh, in this new world? Uh, and I think uh, with Commissioner Freeman's commitment and other commissioners I've talked to, that's the question that a lot of people are asking, a lot of business community leaders are asking is, okay, uh, we at least have a sense on the physical health side where we're going and what we want to do and how to get there. How do we begin to sort of knit that together to make it work better uh, than it does today? Not that people aren't trying to make it work, but what's, what are the three or four or five things we can do to sort of continue to push that? So I think that would be the place I think yeah. would be a next, next great conversation to have, uh, both in the state and, and nationally. So Bob, on that question, if you were, if we, if we changed the Oregon Constitution and you were uh, the monarch king for a day, uh, <laughs> And your first task was to address this shortcoming in healthcare on this question of really making pro more progress on behavioral health integration. Uh, what would you do if you could make, you know, wave a magic wand and automatically change the system? What would you do to, to improve that? Well, the good news is that there isn't a magic wand, so I won't be held responsible, because there isn't really a, a magic <clears throat> wand here. Beha in integrating behavioral health and physical health is so critically important, but there's not one thing you could do or even many things you could do. There are thousands of things that you need to do. We need more mental health providers. Right now in the state, there's a big shortage of mental health providers especially in Roseburg, they're getting sucked up by the VA as fast as they can be produced. So there's a shortage of mental health providers. There's still this dichotomy between mind and body. Uh, and it really is gonna take lots of little clinics to pull this together. So I, that's the magic wand I don't want because I don't think it's one magic wand. I think it's lots of little people, lots of little uh, organizations working together and doing the hard work of integrating physical and mental health. So I won't tell anybody how you answer this question just be between us, yeah, okay. but uh, you know, what, if you could pick a job, any job in the world to be doing as your next big adventure, what kind of work would you like to be doing? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, Tim has his idea. Um, I, I think being involved, deeply involved in the many aspects of what we're doing in Oregon. I think some of the things that have been happening in reform that have been quiet, that are really truly groundbreaking, are for example, the early disclosure, discussion, and resolution thing that the Patient Safety Commission has been doing. A, a new way to deal with uh, when things go wrong. Uh, the Metrics Committee has done an incredible job of putting together the metrics that we've done. So I think I would just continue to do the lots of little good things that Oregon is doing. I mean, I, I'm an AMA delegate, so I get to see people throughout the country, and people are interested first in Oregon football, but after Oregon football <laughs> comes Oregon healthcare, and people are really involved in Oregon healthcare reform. So I think we're right at the forefront. I think I want to just keep doing what I'm doing. So uh, let me ask the same question again a different way. Uh, if, a, if a Centene or a Molina came to you and said, hey, we'd like you to be the plan president and lead our integration efforts in X state, 
Colorado, California, whatever. Do you think you'd have an interest in moving out of state to take what you've learned in Oregon and apply it uh, on a blank slate someplace else? Uh, probably not. I'm very much committed to our local community. I mean, I think our lo things have to start at the local community, and Tim and I work together a lot, and things have to work there. Uh, there are smart people in Colorado who can figure that out on their own. If they want to ask me questions, I'll be able to answer that. But there's a lot of day-to-day -day work that happens. So Tim and I talk about five times a week about the little details of making this work, and it is the little details, and I would encourage people to just keep working on it. Yeah. And uh, I think I'm a Douglas County guy. Yeah, Douglas County guy. It was totally happenstance uh, that we had two Douglas County guys up on, on, on the stage. It's sort of interesting. Tim, how would you uh, answer that? You, you came out jumping out of your chair. What, what should Bob be doing with his time? Well, what I want Dr. Dan Offer to do is to help us continue to be uh, forward thinking in Douglas County. And specifically, we're working on uh, integration of uh, an expanding of uh, the public health system in Douglas County, and he serves on the board with me, actually serves as the president of the board, so I'm hoping very much he stays and does that work. <laughs> that, that's what that response was about. Yeah. So, you know, this is a, uh, in many ways, a political conversation. Is uh, Dr. Pierce going to be the uh, um, candidate Republican nominee for governor, or will there be a more active primary, do you think? So I serve now as a county commissioner in a nonpartisan position. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> so, so I'll take that. Well, you know, I, I don't know, who, I, I can't predict politics, but I know that Bud was one of the people who was truly involved in this liability reform, and actually Sean was with us too. And we spent a long time with doctors and trial lawyers. We spent like a whole summer together trying to figure out how we would do liability reform. And Bud was truly instrumental in getting people to, to listen to each other and to work on new and different things. So I'm not exactly sure about Bud's politics, but he was truly masterful in getting doctors and trial attorneys to work together. So BJ, has Governor Brown demonstrated enough success to deserve full, uh, an election to the remainder of the term? Um, God, why are you? That's the only Democrat I mean. You're, you're active in Salem in a series of different I, policy I think, conversations. I think the governor is doing a remarkable job, and I, I think that especially under the considerations that the governor took office and being able to step up and have such a large impact and hearing public desire for transparency, I think she's doing a fantastic job. Um, around health care, I think it's still too early to see how she's doing and, and whether or not she deserves to be reelected based on, on that. I think if you look at the big picture, the fact that she's been managing to keep you know, parts of the state from completely burning on limited resources while advocating for changes in the way that we pay for forest fires and uh, trying to figure out ways that we could actually prevent forest fires in the future, I think she's doing a, a good job, all in all. So, but she shouldn't run on health care, she should run on natural resource issues or, or other issues? I would venture to say that the governor is not completely a health care person. Yeah. Uh, with no disrespect, I, I, I think it's, it's an interest, and of course she's concerned about it, as she's concerned about all the issues of the state, but um, she is for, better or for worse, working with a system that was put in place by Governor Kitzhaber. Yeah. And she is the keeper. So, uh, Tim, uh, serving in your nonpartisan capacity, but with some partisan experience and background, uh, you know, I, I, people tell me that there's, there's no way a Republican can win statewide. And, and I say, well, gosh, you had a seven-foot-tall guy five years ago that almost won who had no experience in politics except for he played for the right basketball team and went to Yale. Um, if he could almost knock off one of Oregon's, uh, you know, unarguably uh, up until 18 months ago, one of his, uh, Oregon's most successful governors, if he could almost knock off Governor Kitzhaber, doesn't that mean that a, a well-respected, long-standing Republican uh, could win statewide, or do you think it's a fool's errand? Well, I think the numbers are tough. Uh, I have um, certainly spent a lot of time working on legislative races around the state and, and know all the different districts and, and the challenges that you have around the state. 
I do believe um, there are those candidates out there that sort of transcend partisanship and they could, mm -hmm. could rise above that. Uh, a person that I was very much hoping would have ran last time uh, was um, Speaker Bruce Hanna. I thought he was one of those guys that uh, uh, really didn't get bogged down into the partisanship of, of the work that we did. And him and um, um, Speaker Roblin during our co-governance days really showed that, that uh, policy can be done in a bipartisan or a nonpartisan way and, and rise above all that. So I think there's the right people out there. And, and I do think when it comes right down to it, um, there's an awful lot of people that vote for the best candidate. Yeah. And I think producing that best candidate and having the best candidate bring, bring great ideas forward would allow um, somebody from, from either party uh, to be successful. The interesting thing about healthcare, healthcare seems like it becomes a very partisan issue. And you heard me say this earlier, and I apologize for some of the others that are here that heard me say this, but healthcare is not a partisan issue. When you go to the doctor, he asks a whole bunch of questions. The one question he doesn't ask, and some of you remember what I said earlier, how are you registered to vote? Healthcare policy is partisan, but healthcare is not. And somehow that gets missed in all these discussions and it really gets blown up. And I think the media helps with that. I think, um, I think um, candidates uh, sort of use healthcare as a, as a political football. But if you get past all that and talk about the, the importance of the issue of, of health care and the need for health care and the importance of it to our society, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. It should be about getting around a table and figuring out how to solve what is the problems in the way of the health care delivery system. If health care is not political or should not be, taxes can sometimes be political, uh, money and, and revenue. and. Uh, Certainly, uh, the context of the CCO legislation comes out of a, of a dire financial time and the, the $1.9 billion investment that CMS made in Oregon was, a cynic might argue, in part to help offset some of that budget shortfall. I, think, I, don't, think that, I don't think you need to be a cynic to say that. As we move both towards some economic uncertainty, increased rates, China, Greece, et cetera, and we move towards the end of that $1.9 billion waiver, and we move towards the end of 100% federal match of Medicaid expansion, it seems like one could argue that about a year and a half from now, we're gonna have a real tough uh, conversation in Oregon about taxes to fund healthcare. Uh, Sean, what do you think? Will the CCO transformation project work fast enough to mitigate that tax conversation? Or is the CCO transformation project doing great, but you can't, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and you can't turn the entire healthcare system around in five years. And the, the, the multiple alignment of these contextual forces, uh, is that gonna sink transformation or will, will there be a, uh, enough success at, among CCOs to keep it around? I think all signs point positively that there's been enough success. I think the challenge is what does success look like over the next year and a half and two years? Um, and there are a lot of assumptions that go into budgets, right? There's a lot of assumptions that go into how you finance something. Uh, the state's a year and a half away from having to make those decisions. And in a budget that is, uh, the budget people are in the back, so they'll make sure I get it wrong. Uh, there, it's a $14 billion two-year budget with a million people in it. Uh, assumptions change almost overnight. And what was a gap yesterday is a surplus tomorrow. Um, so there's uh, a long ways to go, but I think the, the challenge and the opportunity is to continue to support the CCOs to make sure transformation works. And I think part of the, the magic that I think as we talk to other states um, that people don't quite realize, and, and uh, Commissioner Freeman was there and, and Bob was there, um, it's about that community commitment to making it work. Mm -hmm. So even if there's a conversation two years down the road about whatever the budget looks like, to be able to say, we're gonna figure this out together because transformation has to work. Yeah. And in order for it to work, we have to do X, whatever that X might wind up looking like. So Tim, I wanna to turn to you, but I wanna get BJ and Bob uh, just a quick yes or no. Is healthcare a, a, a fiscal time bomb for the state of Oregon because of the waiver and Medicaid expansion, or is that an overstatement? Just, just real quick, because I want to get Tim to answer this question. It's not a yes or no. I'm, <laughs> so, I mean, if you want to come back to me, it's not a yes or no. Okay. 
Bob, what do you think? Time it, bomb or? It is a fiscal time bomb, but actually the CCO makes the time bombs fuse a bit longer. Okay. Tim, what do you think? So the entire discussion around CCOs started with a budget hole of $247 million in the Oregon health care plan. That's how we started. The idea of doing the work around the CCO was to allow the communities to figure out whatever dollars were sent to them, how to manage those dollars the best they could. So it turned into this how to manage much more dollars with much more people. But when, at the time we did that work, many of us thought the Affordable Health Care Act was going to be found unconstitutional and we would be shrinking uh, the amount of people on Medicaid. So the system is in place and, and the, the legislation allows for growing or shrinking uh, and those decisions are where best to spend those dollars to be made at a, at a community level. That, that was the whole intent of the legislation. So time bomb, uh, that may be a little bit of an extreme way to look at it. Uh, clearly, um, making sure that the payment methodology continues to reward those organizations that find ways to lower the cost instead of punishing them will be a key portion of it. I know they changed that a little bit this year, and they're actually looking at punishing some of the CCOs by reducing rates uh, when they went out and did the very thing that we set out and asked them to do. So I think it's important that they get the payment methodology back corrected the way we had it uh, so that those, those organizations that are doing innovation and lowering costs, uh, getting better outcomes, don't get punished for doing that. Yeah. So we're getting short on time. I want to come, come back to each of you with a, a, a short closing uh, comment. But I want to ask Tim, again, going back to this sort of Republican, uh, your, your experience, uh, would you, can any Republican running statewide, whether it's for the U.S. Senate or for a, a state level position, can any candidate run in Oregon and win if they support full repeal of the Affordable Care Act? <laughs> or do you, is that a pretty much acceptable law now that we, we kind of politically or well, for policy reasons have I, to I accept? I will tell you with the exception of the congressional delegation, uh, any statewide um, would not have a say on that anyway. Right. I'm not sure why they would weigh into that issue. A uh, uh, secretary of state candidate or governor candidate is not going to go to Washington, D.C. and change a federal law. So uh, my, my suggestion would be to focus on what we can do here in Oregon and continue to do the great work that's, that's been, I mean, way before I started this, there had been great work done. Uh, I mean, even though I got cowboy boots like the, the governor does, I certainly wasn't there doing that work then. Um, and, and I think it would be important for a statewide candidate to focus on Oregon issues and things they could control here in Oregon and, and continue the great work that's gone on here and leave the federal politics to D.C. Yeah. So we'll give you the last word, Tim, meaning we'll start with you, Sean, and work our way down. What advice would you give uh, to folks here, but also to the legislature, as they try to figure out, and you can pick one or the other, the market or policymakers or both, what advice would you give as they continue to try to figure out how to improve the system moving forward, mm -hmm. the key principle that they might keep their eye on. So, I, so I'd say two, sort of two things. There's been a, a little bit of a tenor here around the, the stark differences between uh, former Governor Kitzhaber and Governor Brown. And what I would say, and as a challenge to this group, is go get to know her and get to know her team. Uh, there is less different there than you think. Um, she's not from the healthcare space, so it's uh, produces anxiety because people don't know her. Um, but as someone who's worked very closely with her, um, get to know her and that those anxieties will begin to go away. Uh, and then the second piece for her and for the legislators is they need to hear from you uh, about your commitment to transformation uh, and what goals the healthcare system wants to achieve and how they can support that. Uh, and that could be uh, making modifications to what currently happens. It could be helping the health authority uh, continue to uh, get out of the way and let local communities deliver the care. Uh, it could be a whole host of things, but I think uh, what has to happen over the next year and a half to two years is the healthcare community needs to begin to unify uh, even more around where we're going and figure out some policy options and suggestions for uh, those leaders to make those things happen. Bob, what advice to either the market executives or policy leaders in the room here or in Salem would you give? Less rhetoric, more hard work. 
I mean, we, we, we should look at some of the things that we did in transformation. Some of the things worked and some of the things didn't. For example, there was this expanded care clinic. Let's give all these services to the people, the high utilizers, and that'll fix everything. Didn't work. So there's a bunch of stuff that we did that didn't work, and we should look at those things that didn't work and fix them or get rid of them. And there's just a lot of work that goes on. There doesn't have to be a lot of rhetoric. You can't really get rid of ACA unless you have something to replace it with. So let's not spend lots of hours arguing past each other about that. Let's get down to the hard work. And I see a bunch of people in the room who've done this hard work of you know, dental clinics for kids with, with bad teeth and, and uh, public health things that we're, we're really, we can move the dial. So just a lot of hard work, less rhetoric. Great. BJ, same question. What advice to healthcare executives or policy leaders would you offer? Get together more often like this. Um, take the moment to have a cup of coffee or a beer or a glass of wine with someone you see as an opponent and, and try and figure out what your common values are. And from that standpoint, find ways to work together um, on issues because we're not that far apart. It's, we, we all want the same thing. It's how we get there that's important. Um, ignore the rhetoric, move away from the rhetoric. This is not something that we can do with rhetoric. Uh, we've got to do what we can to raise our level of healthcare literacy and the level of healthcare literacy of everybody who is receiving healthcare in the state of Oregon so the consumers are able to make some of the best choices as well. And that's not easy, and it's not gonna be an easy thing. Um, th there are simple things that the, the movement uh, the combination of mental health and physical health uh, means that you are going to be having a fantastic opportunity to keep people adherent to medications. And we know if you stop taking your mental health medications, you generally, very quickly after, stop taking other medications for physical conditions. And what happens is you end up in crisis, you end up in ER. You know, so these are, this is one of the great things that, that's moving forward. And we all need to start having conversations about value, what the value of human life is, what we perceive the value of medications and treatments to be. Um, it's difficult, but what do we see or who do we see as being deserving of having access to some of these things? Drugs are gonna get more and more individualized and absolutely wonderful, absolutely. I mean, the, the, all you people, your children's generation, it's going to be absolutely incredible, the, the medicine and the opportunities that they'll have. But we as a community, and by community I mean patients, state, all of us, we've got to start having some discussions about what is enough, when is enough enough, and what values do we have as a society. And I, I think that that's, that's my takeaway. Great. Tim, final thoughts? So, what advice? Um, to the legislators out there, um, do the work. When I was asked to be part of this healthcare transformation, uh, a lot of you know I came to the legislature to work on public safety issues, not healthcare. And when I was asked to do it, um, when we first started uh, and I was appointed to be uh, one of the co-chairs on, on the joint committee uh, for healthcare transformation, universally every stakeholder didn't want to do it. 100% no, we don't want to change. Uh, we did the hard work, we had the meetings, we, we, we met with folks and we had people come in and talk to us and we listened and we addressed concerns and, and we spent a lot of time and did a lot of work and let people be heard and, and let their knowledge and their experience uh, be part of the solution. Uh, when I co-carried that bill on the House floor uh, with Representative then Representative Kotek, now Speaker Kotek, um, we had a floor letter and almost every single one of the stakeholders signed on to the floor letter. Uh, the amount of effort and work it took to get that done, I think sort of gets missed because of the importance of, of what we're doing and what you all do. But in the legislative process, you have to do that work. You have to listen to people and understand that there's always somebody smarter in the room than you. And if you listen to them, you can get good work done. Uh, to you all that, that continue to dedicate your lives to providing health care and services to, to the people of Oregon, thank you. I think oftentimes nobody ever says thank you. Uh, it's very important and it is a, it's a life worth living. So keep doing what you're doing, be engaged, and make sure you are at the table helping make these decisions.
Great. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Great dialogue. Good to see you.